Okay, welcome everybody to our monthly Food for Thought uh, presentation. Um, some of you, I think, have been to a number of the ones that we've had so far. Um, and this month, since uh, June 1st is the start of hurricane season, we decided to focus on disaster preparedness. So uh, we are very, very excited to have some local experts along with our local expert here at the food bank to share some information about how we prepare for disasters, respond to disasters, and then um, provide you with some planning tips, some checklists, uh, a guide, so that you can prepare in your homes or with your organization as well. So, um, all right. So we have a number of speakers here from the city of Port St. Lucie, um, St. Lucie County, uh, Cleveland Clinic, Martin Health, and then our own uh, Gary Porter here at the Treasure Coast Food Bank, all going to be sharing all of their um, expertise when it comes to everything disaster. So just so you know, the Treasure Coast Food Bank has historically been very involved in disaster prep and disaster response. Um, we are uh, collaborators with the St. Lucie County Emergency Operations Center. Um, when I believe it's a level, is it level two? When there's a level two, Gary has to go to the EOC and stay there until they let him leave. Um, just so that he is up to date and knows everything that's going on, where different areas where we may need to respond, where we need to coordinate with our agency partners and with the county and the state and at the federal level even. Um, to get resources like water, MREs, ice, um, different cleaning supplies, um, all different types of things that we respond with in order to help people um, after the disaster. So we're, we're distributing food, water, um, other essentials. Uh, it really depends on the, um, the impact in the area, but we are prepared and in collaboration with uh, multiple levels of organizations in the disaster response field in order to be able to um, meet the needs of the community depending on the impact. Um, we spring into action right after the disaster. Um, we do prepare ahead of time too. We will pre-stage food and water at our agency partners depending on the information that we have at the time about where impact will be. Um, whether it's a hurricane, if there's, uh, you know, uh, a tropical storm or even some tornadoes, that's been happening a lot lately. Um, and so we will work with our agency network. We will get things out into areas so that if after the disaster uh, we have um, a difficulty getting out to certain locations, we have product staged throughout our four, our four county service area um, so people can immediately get relief. Um, and as part of the Feeding America network, which is the nationwide network of food banks, we are all connected with other food banks, particularly in the state of Florida. We are a member of Feeding Florida, which is the State Association of Florida Food Banks. Um, when we see that there's activity starting anywhere, we have um, calls. And a lot of times those calls are every day leading up to where the anticipated impact is. And depending on the service area that's impacted, all of the other food banks will jump in to help provide resources. Um, if it's on the West Coast, but they feel like based on what they're hearing, there's not enough resources, we will all spring into action. We will send them our water. We will send them our MREs once we get permission from the state to move them. Um, and so, and we will be on hand so that depending on how long the recovery is, if their staff responding needs respite because they're working all the time to help people, we can send people over there to relieve them, give them some rest, and make sure that the recovery efforts are still happening. So, um, so even when other organizations leave, we are still here. Um, we provide resources. We help people rebuild their households. Um, we had a grant. Um, a few years ago, and it was for recovery for Hurricane Irma that had happened three years prior. Um, and we had people that were still having issues with the roof, um, with some of the appliances that broke down, with flooding that needed to be repaired, and we were able to, in conjunction with Volunteer Florida, help those people. So um, we're here for the long run, and uh, we're here for our partner agencies as well. If they have resources um, in the long term, uh, 
And so that's, that's kind of how we work as a network, and we work in conjunction with all of the speakers here today that we are going to be hearing from. So I'm going to bring up as our first speaker, Gary Porter, our Director of Community Relations. Well, good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming out today. It's good to see everyone, some familiar faces. Um, so as part of our emergency response, um, we're very much into knowing how to prepare, encouraging folks to prepare, and then responding. Um, Treasure Coast Food Bank is res recognized as a first responder when it comes to disasters. That's for pandemics, hurricanes, tornadoes, floods, any kind of an emergency within our four county service area. We are first responders. Uh, we are the lead agency for ESF 11, which is for food and water for St. Lucie County, working along our partners here. Um, ESF is an, what I call an emergency support function. And um, we also partner with the state of Florida emergency response team. Um, Feeding Florida, as Krista mentioned, is um, a network for Florida food banks. With those food banks, we stage products strategically so that if a food bank is affected, and maybe there's not a way for us to get <clears throat> into our, our service area, then those food banks can come and assist us. So um, it's a great partnership, and we receive a lot of benefits from that. And of course, as Krista mentioned, the Feeding America Network of Food Banks. So just went through that, sorry. We also um, are really fortunate to have a production kitchen where we can actually prepare meals. Um, with our production kitchen, if um, you've not had the chance to go by there, please make an opportunity to, to stop by and take a tour. It's pretty amazing. But with that production kitchen, we actually have the ability to produce 25 to 50,000 trade meals per day and up to 100,000 uh, congregate meals in a day. And that's a great benefit for the community, especially for a disaster, because um, whenever we start going out into the community and trying to serve those folks that are really you know, facing the emergency that are directly impacted, having those meals available and having the ability to do that many meals in a day is very, very important for recovery efforts. As Krista mentioned, we also have a very robust mobile pantry program. Um, with our mobiles, we do ramp those up in, in an emergency situation to where we can go directly out into the community and distribute um, food, water, other essentials as we normally would do um, on a regular basis, but we would ramp that up obviously to meet the need of the community that's affected. So hurricane evacuation, on your, on your chairs, you've received a hurricane preparedness guide that we put together, and that is a great way for you to kind of be able to prepare. And um, we also have a uh, hurricane preparedness checklist on our table here. Um, on your way out, grab one of those. This is actually included in the preparedness guide, but it's just a simpler breakdown to where you can actually complete this and have it set up for your family. Um, it's very, very important, again, as you prepare for that to make sure not only you know how to prepare, but that your family know how to prepare. Um, it's also making sure you know how to contact your family if you're not with your family. Um, have a point to meet or have an out-of-town location. Um, again, those are just all things that are included in that guide for you. So some of the dangers of a hurricane, 40% of the U.S. directed hurricanes impact the state of Florida. And I believe that's going to be even more this year with the La Nina, La Nino um, effect, which is... Um, not exciting to talk about, but it's realistic. Um, but also a storm surge can reach up to 25 feet and move miles inward. And then in just a simple note, in 2005, Hurricane Katrina caused more than $125 billion in damage and over 1,200 casualties. So pre prepare, prepare, prepare. Hurricanes are massive storm systems that form over ocean waters and often move toward land. These Threats from hurricanes include high winds, high, heavy rainfall, storm surge, coastal and inland flooding, rip currents, and tornadoes. And of course, as we mentioned, with the preparedness guide, it's very, very important that you prepare now. Um, a lot of people, I've been guilty of this, we kind of wait till there's one on the radar, you know, like, well, it's time to start preparing now, let's get our things together. But if you prepare now, you're good to go, you can take care of your family, when during a, a hurricane, you want to make sure that you are able to survive that. Follow the guidance that's provided for you. Uh, if you're advised to evacuate, please do so. Uh, for protection from high winds, you want to definitely watch out for the winds. Watch out for flooding. 
Um, you're going to try to move to higher ground for that. And then if you ever come across a, a puddle of water, you know, and it may be the same street you drive down every day, use caution. Um, turn around, don't drown is the motto. You never know that water puddle could have a sinkhole. Um, it could be something that your car could actually get stuck. You could be trapped. You could even drown. And then after the storm, just be safe. Return to the area. Never walk or drive. Um, look out. Do not remove any heavy debris by yourself. And again, do not drink the water until you're advised to do so. And of course, stay informed. Emergency notifications. We have a wonderful notification system here in St. Lucie County. Um, you can sign up for alerts. There are apps that you can download on your phone. Um, I get them all the time for severe thunderstorm warnings. Um, it's a really a great resource. Uh, we do have all this information provided in your um, emergency preparedness guide so that you can download those apps and know how to stay informed when danger does approach. So be careful watching out for watches and warnings, tropical storms and hurricane advisories. Um, there's also tropical storm hurricane watch. The watch is 48 hours out and then the warning would be 36 hours out. So whenever you start seeing the watch, that gives you that little bit of time to start preparing your family and figuring out what you're going to do. When the hurricane warning approaches, you got a little less time, but you still have some time to prepare. And with that, I will turn it over to Ronnie Heen. So thank you, guys. Thanks, Gary. Oh, thank you. All right. Hey, uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Ronnie Heen. I'm with the City of uh, Port St. Lucie Office of Emergency Management. So um, one of the first things I want to say is uh, appreciate you guys having us here um, today to talk about all this. I appreciate your messaging uh, and that disaster guide that you guys have is, is, is spot on with information that we need. So um, I'm just going to talk about what we do more locally at the city level, and I'm going to let Oscar talk about what they do for the county side. So um, you can see that our mission, we focus on lives, property, and the environment uh, for the community, and then what we can do to address like an all-hazards approach. Um, with our vision, we're talking about what we can do as an emergency management program uh, for preparedness and mitigation efforts. Gotcha. Um, and with that, we're looking at what we can do for the recovery. So essentially, we're looking at what we can do beforehand and what we can help the citizens and the residents and the businesses uh, post-storm or post-event. So um, with that, what we like to do is our Office of Emergency Management, we work with all of our local uh, departments, and we coordinate and communicate what the planning efforts need to be and what information we need to be what we can be doing to better prepare for the events um, when they happen, as well as getting the right policies and procedures in place so we can recover from an incident if it does take place. So with that, um, I gave an example. We have uh, each one of our departments has a hurricane preparedness guide, um, which kind of tells them how to prep for and then when we actually go into activation mode. And then we also work on standard operating guidelines on what they can do at a local level and the pretty much it's a it's kind of like a little checklist like here's what we need to do um, with that we also engage with uh, community outreach like this type of presentation um, and then we also look at we just had our hurricane expo which was last saturday which um, was a free event where we brought together um, local uh, businesses and communities as well as other organizations that engage with uh, disaster preparedness within pretty much the Indian River through Martin County. Um, I don't know if we got anybody from Okeechobee this year, but um, definitely lo always looking for opportunities uh, to improve information and letting people know about what mitigation opportunities there are out there. With that, we also work with all of these stakeholders on what potential uh, grant opportunities there may be. And with, right currently, right now, our office is working with three different grant programs. Uh, you can see these right on the top is we have hazard mitigation grants, we have community uh, development block grants, and we also are working with Department of Commerce on uh, another type of, uh, just another funding opportunity to kind of focus on what our capabilities are. Uh, with that one, you can see it's at the very bottom, it's the threat and hazard identification risk analysis. Um, and what that does is it helps 
these organizations, these businesses, identify capabilities and gaps that they may have in their plans and what we can do to address and maybe uh, close them. So these are other examples of the exercises that we do, um, providing opportunities for city staff. So we do monthly training and then our exercises within the community. Uh, we have our hurricane exercise in two weeks where we'll bring in and kind of do a mock activation where we bring in everybody, we set up our EOC, and we go through the motions, and we have exercise injects and a scenario that they will actually engage and take part in. Um, the Florida Recovery Obligation, this is, uh, it's actually a really good program that uh, they started up about two years ago, and what this does is it helps individual municipalities and agencies look at what their disaster plans are and then how they can improve them, looking for the documentation that's gonna be required for the public assistance aspect. And the public assistance is more the funding that you get to pay back the organizations afterwards. So it's not only just for the local government, but it's also for the, um, uh, the other businesses and uh, how we can help pay back not only the people who are working for the storm, but also pay back those agencies that are uh, contributing um, for the recovery efforts. And our last, uh, the last thing I have right here is the continuity of operations planning. And this is essentially what it sounds like. This is, it doesn't have to be a major storm that maybe shut down a business, but if there was, um, if a fire broke out in a building, in a government building, and the sprinklers went off and all of our information and computers went down, where would we, where could we find building space that would host our technology that would be able to house 30, 40, 80 people to continue what we need to do uh, for either local operations or um, not, and not necessarily a major incident, but just maintaining the, ne the everyday operations that we need to maintain. So. Um, yeah, I just want to say thank you for that, and we actually are right in the middle of our tax holiday right now as well. So that's definitely something where it started on June 1st, and it goes through the 14th. So at the local level, this is a great opportunity to kind of build your disaster kits and kind of look at this checklist um, that uh, Gary has provided and kind of look at what items you may need to purchase um, while we still have another week of that disaster tax. Uh, there is a second week. It's at the, it's the last week of August and the first week of September. And what that is, is just another opportunity right in the peak of hurricane season to, um, to purchase anything that you may need for those disaster kits. So yeah, so essentially, so when we do a local activation, so I will bring in our, our local utilities, police, fire, um, our finance people, we have a planning section, so um, it's, uh, we are bringing in uh, a recovery consultant to kind of watch and like make sure we're going through the motions the right way, as well as responding to and seeing, identifying gaps that may be in our system. Hey, if we have, we have a new app that tracks, um, we have a new app that tracks like hourly for each one of the employees that we have. So if we send out 20 people, we want to make sure 20 people get paid, you know, for those assessments and whatnot that they're doing, as well as testing the system that helps us do the site surveys that kind of identify housing uh, damages and stuff like that as well. So we are kind of pushing some of these things out. We build every year where we do a practice and then we do a functional, and this is our full scale uh, that we're doing this year. Thank you. Oscar, I think you're up. It's still morning, so good morning. Um, I am Oscar Hans. I am the Emergency Management Division Manager for St. Lucie County, um, part of the Public Safety Department. I want to thank Gary and, and, and the rest of the staff here for having us out and giving us the opportunity to, to talk to you all. Um, Gary kind of did a really good job on preparation. Um, usually that's our focus when we come out to these events is, is preaching preparation. So since Gary did such a wonderful job of that, I'm gonna tell you what the county does um, at the county level, similar to what Ronnie just discussed about the city. So the Emergency Management Division, we plan, train, and exercise 
for disasters and, and responding to disasters, recovering from disasters. Um, we involve government and non-government non agencies. Um, we use an all-hazards approach, so everybody in Florida thinks hurricanes automatically, but we, we take an all-hazard approach, whether it's a, a hazmat spill or a tornado or, or different weather events um, or perhaps a building collapse or large accidents or whatever it may be, train derailments. Um, we make sure that we take everything into consideration and we incorporate that into our planning. Um, we have plans pretty much for, for everything. We have a, a tsunami plan. Um, tsunami is not a huge threat here in Florida, but we do have a plan just, just in case. It doesn't hurt. Um, and then we educate residents on emergency preparedness. Um, this is the season to do that. We, we try to do it year round. Um, I actually went out with Christina and did an exercise a few months ago um, with the hospitals out there. Ronnie, we did an outreach, as he said, at the Hurricane Expo. Um, and then we have different outreach events throughout the year. The Emergency Operations Center um, is out by the fairgrounds, out west of town, here in Fort Pierce. Um, it is a building where everybody comes together, and that's where we communicate and we coordinate and we, we get what we need to the people who need them. Um, somebody was asking about who, who is everybody coming together. For us, we have federal partners that come in. We'll have the National Guard come in. We'll have the Coast Guard come in. We'll have FEMA come in. Um, and then we have state partners. Uh, the Florida Division of Emergency Management has a seat at our table. We have local governments come in. Uh, the city of Port St. Lucie will send somebody in. The city of Fort Pierce will send somebody in. Every law enforcement agency um, in the county will have representation there. Fire district will have representation there. And then all of the county departments, um, utilities, public works, public safety, um, finance, um, every, every department within the county also has representation at the EOC. On top of that, we have non-governmental agencies, non-governmental -non organizations like the Treasure Coast Food Bank. Gary mentioned ESF 11, Food and Water. Um, he sits in our EOC, or his staff sits in our EOC, just in case we need to communicate with him and coordinate with him to get food, water out to the public, whatever it may be. So it's, it's a true whole community approach that we use. Um, we bring everybody, everybody has a seat at the table that, that has decision-making authority to respond to whatever needs to be responded to. Um, I mentioned coordinating with the local jurisdictions, the state of Florida. Um, one thing that, that Ronnie and I were talking about before this meeting started, um, we use a software, it's called Web EOC. Um, it is essentially a communi communication software where the city of Port St. Lucie, they use their own instance to communicate within themselves, but they can use that to request resources from us at the county level if they can't meet those needs. For us at the county level, if we can't meet those needs, we'll use it to, to reach out to the city of Port St. Lucie, but we also use it to reach out to the state. Um, if we can't find it locally, we reach out to the state and they'll help us find what we're looking for and get it out to us as quick as possible. As far as non-emergency activities, um, what we do and what we call blue sky days is we go to work, we sit in our office, we review our plans, we update our plans, um, whether it's for preparedness, response, recovery, or mitigation. Um, we're part of several committees throughout the county um, that focus on, on these different topics. But that's our core function is prepare, respond, recover, and mitigate. There's a definition and purpose of the EOC. What it is, it's a central hub for coordinating emergency response and recovery efforts. That's, that's what we do. Um, all the agencies come together. The people out on the field, law enforcement, fire rescue, public works, whatever it may be, they communicate with us, tell us what they need, we do what we can to get it out to them as quickly and efficiently as possible. We have different act activation levels. So every day we're at a level three activation, which is just normal operations. If we have an incident occur, we determine how severe it is and what the response needs to be. It could go up to a level two activation, which we, we call it a, a partial activation. The partial activation is not everybody. It's just the people that we need in the OC to get the job done. 
Um, if we go to a full activation, um, just so you all know, we will automatically go to a full activation for a Cat 3 or above. There are times we'll go to a full activation for a tropical storm, um, just depending on what the, the predictions are. Um, but that brings everybody to the table, and it's, it's a full-on operation. It's 24-7. We split the shifts, 12 hours, 12 hours. We have bunk rooms in there. We have showers in there. We have a full kitchen in there. We have vendors come in and feed us if need be. Um, but it's, it's long hours, stressful situation, and making sure that the community gets what they need in a timely fashion um, to protect the lives um, and, and the health and the safety of everybody. Let's see, key functions and activities, coordination of resources, resource allocation, logistics management, communication, public information, dissemination. It's one person I left out. We do have a public information officer within, that sits in the EOC, but it's not just for the county. We also have public information from fire rescue, public information from the cities, law enforcement. Everybody comes in, so we're all delivering the same message to the citizens of the county. We do have the countywide responsibility. Um, we are the liaison to the state and to FEMA, and also to the municipal emergency management agencies. We are fortunate that the city of Port St. Lucie has an outstanding emergency management program. Um, they, are, they are excellent partners. We, we talk regularly and, and try, to, try to stay on the same page and, and address any, any issues that we may identify. Um, and then we ensure seamless integration and support across all jurisdictions. Like I said, it's a, it's a whole community approach. Importance of community partnerships. It's, like I say, it's all about collaboration. Um, we have local businesses that come in and sit in our EOC and, and work with us throughout the year. Volunteer groups, faith-based organizations. Um, we also have the Treasure Coast Food Bank. I'm gonna keep giving them a shout out because they do such an excellent job. They're a huge, huge, um, asset to the community here in St. Lucie County. Um, they, they do more than they say they do. I'll just leave it at that. Um, Gary mentioned Hurricane Irma. You guys were pretty active during COVID, I believe. Um, had some pretty good operations going on. Um, just, just an amazing, amazing organization here in St. Lucie County. Um, and by having these, these partnerships, we have an improved availability of resources, um, improved logistical distribution, um, enhanced community resilience and quicker recovery, greater public awareness and engagement in preparedness activities, and like I said, a whole community approach. Um, that, that is what we're about, is making sure it's not just the people in Port St. Lucie, it's not the people, just the people in Fort Pierce, it's the whole community, and we want to involve the entire community in our decision making, in our, in our planning, and in our response and recover effort, recovery efforts. So to wrap it all up, um, the ongoing need for preparedness at all levels, from individuals to organizations, um, value of strong community networks and effective emergency response and recovery. And then looking ahead, um, St. Lucie County Emergency Management, we, uh, we're continuously doing everything we can to be better than last time, to be better than last yesterday. Um, and, and it really takes input from the public. Um, we, we know what we're told. We do our best to get out there. We hold events at the libraries um, throughout the year and really invite people to come in and just, just have conversations with us. Get to know us, we get to know you, get to know the needs of the community so that we can plan and prepare accordingly. I think that's it. And I guess I will pass it off to Christina. Hey, good morning, everyone. My name is Christina Pru. I am with uh, Cleveland Clinic Martin Health. So uh, if you're not familiar with uh, Cleveland Clinic, I'll show you a little uh, image here. So our map here is uh, obviously of Florida, and you can see that there's three different areas in there. So Cleveland Clinic has hospitals in Florida <clears throat> within the, uh, in the Broward County area, in uh, Martin, St. Lucie County, and in Indian River County. 
So I lead the emergency management department for Cleveland Clinic Martin Health, which is two hospitals in Martin County and one hospital in St. Lucie County. In addition to that, we have roughly 19 ambulatory facilities that we see patients at, and we also have a freestanding ED, or emergency department, in St. Lucie West. So a lot, uh, a lot spanning across two hospitals for emergency management to cover. And we'll talk through that a little bit today. And I think that you'll hear quite a few similarities between what we do in emergency management, what Port St. Lucie and what St. Lucie County Emergency Management do as well, because we all follow a structure that, is that has been practiced again and again and again throughout the nation and throughout the world, and it works. So uh, on the bottom here, you can see our, uh, our three hospitals that I mentioned. The two in Martin County are Cleveland Clinic Martin North Hospital, Cleveland Clinic Martin South Hospital, and Cleveland Clinic Tradition Hospital, along with uh, some of the other facilities that I mentioned. <clears throat> so thinking about emergency management, a lot of what we want to focus on throughout the year is what we're doing beforehand, what we're doing during, and what we're doing following any type of incident or emergency. So today, we're talking about hurricanes, but we really truly are an all-hazards emergency management program. So when we talk about pre-emergency, we're continually trying to make sure that we are prepared and we are ready to activate and ready to respond at a moment's notice. During an emergency, we look to immediately activate if need be and really look at our emergency response teams and our incident command centers. So we'll talk through that a little bit today as well. And when we talk about in intelligence and information sharing, we, uh, we actually heard from our other community partners here in the city and the county what that is. How do we share communications? How do we notify not just the community but in the hospital? How do we notify our staff or our caregivers? How do we notify patients if something's going on? So we'll talk through that a little bit as well. And then post-emergency or following an emergency, which could be any number of different incidents. We work through debriefing and evaluating the effectiveness of a response. So Oscar quite literally just spoke through that. Why do we do that? We do that to improve. Every single time we have a training, every single time we work through an exercise, and every single time we have a true real world incident, we want to make sure that we are learning from those experiences and applying what we've learned to be better and safer and faster in our emergency actions and efforts. So what do we do in the hospital every single day? Life safety, right? So we want to make sure that in an emergency, when it truly, truly, truly is, uh, is it truly, truly counts the most, we want to ensure that we are protecting the safety of our patients, our caregivers, and our visitors, maintaining continuity of operations and, uh, and care for those inv individuals as well, and ensuring those prompter emergency response times that I mentioned. In addition to life safety, we also want to try to mitigate damage to any of our facilities and properties if we can. So we take care of lives first, and secondary to that, we try to mitigate damages to critical infrastructure, to anything that um, would cause us to not be able to reopen quickly. And of course, we always want to work through and strengthen our resiliency. So some of the planning actions, and I spoke about them a little bit, we're an, we're an all hazards emergency management program, and we really work through um, integrated response plans. So we have so many different response plans depending on the incident that can happen. Uh, you may have heard in hospitals, a lot of hospitals operate under codes, color codes. So what, uh, what those basically mean is overhead, if we have a code that's called and our caregivers know what that is, we may have a code red. So if you had to take a guess, what would you say what would you say a code red could be? Cardiac arrest. Cardiac arrest, what else? It's a good guess. So in our hospital, it's a fire. So uh, there, there's a lot of different things that we need to do, but because of that, we need to train and we need to educate our caregivers so that they know what, at a moment's notice, what they need to do and what those actions and what those responses are. That was a really good guess, though. So uh, we work through that. Um, Interagency collaboration with local, regional, state, and federal partners. So our, uh, our partners just over here, our local partners, we uh, actually just heard from Oscar. He came out to a mass casualty incident exercise that we just had across all of our sites. We had actors come in, and they were fully moulaged, bloody, gory, and, um, right? It's, it's the most realistic that we can be in a safe environment when we exercise. So they come through, and it was... Um, the scenario was a terrorist attack, 
and we went through the actions in our emergency departments to respond to as quickly as possible, save as many lives as we could, and in addition to that, really protect and ensure that the hospital was secure and safe as well. Because that's something from a security standpoint that we have to keep in mind. If, if this is happening out in the community, is that something that could potentially impact not just our hop hospital operations, but the threat potentially could come into our facilities as well. So we have to really think through a lot of those things. Uh, Ronnie actually talked about a hazard vulnerability analysis. Uh, they, they call it a thyra, um, but uh, in, in the hospital we call it an HVA or hazard vulnerability analysis. What hazards are in our community that could impact our hospital operations? And what are our greatest level of, levels of risk that we have across our sites? And then when we go through and we identify those on an annual basis, we work through training and exercising and any mitigation actions that we possibly can in order to ensure that we uh, mitigate as much, uh, as much of that on the front end as possible. So <clears throat> as far as trainings and exercises go, some of you smiled when, we mentioned, uh, when I mentioned the mass casualty incident, but that's what we do. Every single month, we work through a different exercise. So let's, uh, we'll, we'll do it one more time. What do you think we're exercising on this month? What's your guess? Hurricanes, everyone got that, right? So um, we, we activate our, uh, our incident management teams and let them really run through and practice what their emergency response would be for, in that example, a hurricane. So when I mention incident management teams, this is what our structure looks like. And this is a structure that's very, very widely used uh, across many, many different agencies. It's called an incident command or incident command system. If you know anybody in fire rescue, if you know anybody in law enforcement, if you know anyone in the military, if you know anyone else like us in emergency management, we all use it. It works wonderfully. So <clears throat> the, uh, the top right image there really just shows Cleveland Clinic Martin Health. So we have an incident management team for each of our hospitals, and that team is responsible for ensuring that the incident, quite literally, is managed appropriately so that we can, as quickly as possible, return to normal operations. So we have a, we have a incident management team for each hospital, as mentioned, and then we also have a corporate command or area command team that helps us to share resources and ensure that each of the facilities has what they need. So the bottom image there shows <clears throat> what, um, what our partners over here were just mentioning. When we, when we run through activation, there's, uh, there's, there's different individuals that have to do different things. So Ronnie mentioned, I believe it was Ronnie, uh, mentioned uh, <laughs> PIO or public information officer, it may have been Oscar, sorry, <clears throat> and, um, and what that looks like with, uh, within the community. So these are just some examples of, of what that looks like. There's a planning section chief. That planning section chief is responsible for all of the thinking throughout that emergency and what needs to happen. We also have a logistics section chief. They're the getters. We talked about logistics earlier, Gary. Logistics in the Treasure Coast Food Bank is phenomenal. <clears throat> um, we have uh, an operations section. They're the doers. They go out and do the tactics. They get it done and they make it happen. And then we have our finance admin section as well that's responsible for ensuring continuity of, uh, of, of, of our finances, right? So just, uh, just like the city and the county, we have different levels of activation. Every day, we, uh, we consider those blue sky or non-emergency days. So we're level three, we're monitoring, we're, uh, we're doing what we normally do. And then uh, if we need to activate, we'll go into a level two or a level one, which is a partial activation or a full-scale activation. So those images there of those teams, that's how those teams activate for us, us in Cleveland Clinic. We may only need to activate a few of the uh, sections on that list, or we may need to activate all of them based off of the needs of the emergency. So within Cleveland Clinic, just to give you an idea of our structure, when we mention our local sites, that's our local hospitals and our local incident management teams. But because if you remember the image uh, of Florida, we had Indian River and we had uh, Martin Health, which is again Martin and St. Lucie, and then we also had our Weston Hospital, which is in Broward County. So we consider that the Florida market or the Florida region of Cleveland Clinic, and there's a team at that level as well that helps to support us should we need additional resources. And then above that, we have an enterprise team in Ohio that's able to do that as well. So it's very important in emergency management that we have redundancies, whether that's redundancies in staffing positions, whether that's redundancies in critical teams like this, whether that's redundancies in communication. 
So it's very important that we plan for that uh, throughout the year. And then when do we activate? We have different triggers that are identified so we know when, uh, when we need to move forward with, with activation of our teams. So just kind of wrapping up here, when we look at the 2024 hurricane season, who in here is native Floridian? A few hands, okay. Who's been here for more than one year? All right, so everyone for the most part has experienced some type of hurricane preparedness. Is that, is that a fair statement? All right, I love, I love to hear that, so that's great. So what we do in, uh, in the hospital every year is a, is a very, very long list of, uh, of preparedness. And just to give a few bullet points uh, of that, we'll really just kind of focus on providing presentations to our teams. It's so important for us to ensure that all of our caregivers, again, which uh, we call staff caregivers, that all of our caregivers are prepared and ready to go, not just in their working environment, but in their home environment as well. Are they ready to come into work and give it 110%? Are they ready to come into work and not worry about if their homes are secured, if their families are safe, if their neighbors are okay? Have they remembered to do everything that they need to for their pets? So we really run through a lot of uh, presentations for our teams. We ensure that those incident management teams on the previous slide are prepared and, uh, and trained accordingly. Um, that annual exercise that I mentioned earlier that we activate all of our teams for for hurricane season, we do that as well. Making sure that we have redundancies in our teams. Uh, in addition to those incident management teams, we have what we call storm teams. Those are our caregivers who are literally activated to care for patients and to ensure hospital operations during the emergency or during the hurricane. So they're the ones sleeping overnight. They're the ones that uh, are, are maintaining our, our operations within the hospital. And then again, those incident management teams are managing the incident. We have uh, disaster agreements with many members of our community that, uh, that we need to make sure are on point in addition to all of our transfer and transportation agreements with our uh, agency companies. <clears throat> we have plans for 96-hour continuity inventories. So if something happened right now today, can we sustain for 96 hours in all of our facilities? So that is a year-round thing for us, and in hurricane season, we really don't mess around. Uh, faci facility mitigation actions, that can be a number of different things. That can be mitigation of critical infrastructure <clears throat> uh, in, uh, in our facilities. Coordinating with local public safety agency partners. Oscar gave a wonderful presentation yesterday out at the uh, St. Lucie County EOC that really helped us to prepare for, uh, for that. We've collaborated with the uh, city of Port St. Lucie as well and Martin County to, uh, to ensure that all of us together have one unified plan, one unified approach, and that way when we need to, we can pick up the phone and say, hey, what do you need? I'm here to help you, or you know what? I really, really, really think that we could use some additional support here with whatever, whatever that may be happening. Uh, I, mean, I mentioned communications redundancies before. We need to ensure that all of our communications platforms are working. We utilize a system called Everbridge. That Everbridge system uh, really helps us, and I know the, uh, our county partners here do as well, that helps us to communicate and notify our teams. It actually activates our teams as well and um, helps us to push critical information and notifications to, uh, to all of them immediately in order to ensure that we have those prompt responses. We have to ensure that our radios and emergency phones and everything are, um, are in working order throughout the year and in hurricane season, as I said, we, uh, we really, really test it quite, quite a bit more frequently. So for interagency collaboration, it's quite a bit lengthier than uh, those few bullet points there, but speaking really just to hurricane season, National Weather Service is a fantastic partner. They uh, collaborate with all of, the, uh, all of the counties and municipalities throughout the state. And uh, I would say that we are very fortunate to have that relationship with them in, um, in working through hurricane season. In the hospital or healthcare setting, we have ACA or the Agency for Healthcare Administration. And uh, they are very, very helpful in ensuring that we are uh, receiving any, anything that is needed as well as the Florida Hospital Administration. So to tell a quick story, in 2022 for Hurricane Ian, do you all remember the hurricane going uh, over on the Gulf Coast and how it critically impacted that community? Did you hear about all the hospital evacuations that happened over there because of all of their infrastructure damage? So a lot of the hospitals on, uh, on the West Coast ended up coming our way. 
So when we mention ACA and we mention FHA or the Florida <coughs> Hospital Association, those agencies were very, very instrumental in identifying bed censuses or bed availability within the hospitals that were not impacted. So at Martin Health, we were prepared for those impacts. We thought that we were going to initially receive, uh, receive that hurricane coming in our way, and we were preparing for those initial impacts. But what I learned in that hurricane was we also need to be on standby for what we now call secondary impacts. So those secondary impacts, we deactivated those incident management teams. We did not have to bring in any of those storm teams, but what we saw after was a very, very urgent and immediate request for support to take patients that we needed to be transferred out of those facilities. So those secondary impacts caused us to reactivate our teams and ensure that we could take in those patients as fast as we could. And another thing that we learned from that, uh, from that incident, from that hurricane, was that a tremendous amount of communications capabilities went down there. So on the West Coast, they weren't able to go through the normal chains to request resources and to request support. So in Cleveland Clinic, we were able to almost do it in reverse, where we were pulling patients from them when they were able to safely get them out of the hospitals rather than waiting for them to make the requests. So we were doing it for them. And many, many other hospitals across the state of Florida did the same thing. And I think that's such a tremendous partnership to say that our community is not just here in our local counties. It really does expand into the entire state, knowing that in the hospital or healthcare system, we could potentially be taking in patients to support other facilities. <clears throat> and, uh, and, and I just wanted to close out with our, uh, our local partners, Treasure Coast Food Bank, City of Port St. Lucie, St. Lucie County, you all are fantastic. We absolutely think that the partnerships we have in this community are phenomenal. The partnerships, and I'm going to say the partnerships with our residents are just as important and just as critical because your preparedness levels help us to ensure that we are not receiving as many patients in the hospitals, making sure that the counties know that your, your homes are safe and that your uh, plans are in place. So it's, it's truly a full and whole community approach. Thank you all so much for your time today. Again, my name is Christina. If you have any questions uh, for all of us, we're, uh, we're just right here. Thank you. Thank you all so much for your wonderful presentations. I know that um, we all received a lot of really great information. And um, you know the, the speakers will be here if you have um, any questions. So does, does anybody have any questions they want to ask right now? Let me bring the mic to you. Okay, so I'm from Indian River County, and I see you guys really got it together down here. Do you work, do you work closely with uh, that county too, like in emergencies and stuff? Yeah, yeah, get the mic. So the answer is yes. Um, the Indian River County Emergency Management staff, we're, we're very close. Um, Ryan Lloyd leads the charge down there. Um, their, their radiological emergency preparedness person, um, Mason Kozak, his, his mom actually worked for us for St. Lucie County. Um, she now works for the Florida Division of Emergency Management. So we really have a really, really close relationship with them. Ryan came down to the city of Port St. Lucie. I'll let Ronnie speak to that. But, but the answer is yes. We, we have a very, very good relationship with not only Indian River County, but with Okeechobee to the west of us and the rest of the state. Um, we, we often meet at different conferences across the state. I went up to the Panhandle earlier this year. They had a big hurricane conference in West Palm last month, I think it was. Um, so we all, as an emergency management community, come together regularly throughout the year and build those relationships, exchange information, talk shop, um, discuss plans, procedures, best practices, and whatnot. The question was, do they have similar stuff that, that, that we have? The answer is yes. Um, every, every county across the state of Florida is required to have an emergency management program. Um, their facilities vary um, based on, on, on their, their funds available and, and, and the population. Um, but yeah, it's, everybody is required by law to have an emergency management program. 
All right, you're speaking my language. Born and raised in Vero Beach, so I did my internship in Indian River County. Ryan, Rachel, Aaron, they just got a new guy, Mike and Mason, Indian River. Uh, they're one of the 67 counties they, that they had mentioned. Not every county has municipalities like ourselves in Port St. Lucie where we also have an emergency management element. Um, so essentially, for Indian River County, all of their emergency management is handled at the county level. So all their, st their staff of six or seven, they're uh, located uh, across from Dodger Town on 43rd. Um, um, so that, that there, that's where their EOC location is, and they're co-located with the, uh, essentially where the fire chiefs and their EMS, or their e emergency services director is. So yes, they, I'm sorry. Oh, uh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And so, so we don't do this in, in silos. I don't work. If I'm, I, I invited Ryan to come to help us evaluate our exercise. Same thing with Oscar. Um, I, like, and with Martin County, uh, we know the directors and the deputy directors down there. We are a close knit, like the collaboration that exists, like what we talked about with our, our community, with our with our people, we get these ideas and we learn and build based on the conversations we have with our partners. So I got to go over to Lee County and work in their EOC for a couple weeks post-storm and kind of seeing how the integration and how much, not only just the devastation aspect of it, but how much you have to come together and you have to work these collaborations and these stakeholders, whether you're opening shelters or you're giving out food and water, these are, these are huge operations that can't just be done with the four or five people we have or the three people we have in our shops and stuff like that. But the collaboration for the Treasure Coast is very strong and we do have a great partner with our uh, with the Treasure Coast Food Bank, which is unique, I would say, for our area. Of course. For food and water in Indian River, Martin, and Okeechobee County, we do have a seat at the table with those folks. So we are there to plan and coordinate uh, in addition, as we would just as we would do with St. Lucie County, we're there and we're involved in those discussions. So, because we do support the whole Treasure Coast, so we wanted to make sure we're involved in that process. I think there was another question over here. Did anyone else have another question? Do you have that packet? Do you have that packet like electronically that you could send to us where we could forward that? Yes, actually the packet is available on our website. So if you go to stophunger.org, um, there is a place for it under the um, get help section. It's a drop down and it'll have hurricane preparedness guide. So you can download it off of our website as well. And also a quick plug that each municipality, Indian River, St. Lucie, Martin County also have hurricane preparedness guides that will help show you additional information to help build this. So um, showing shelters, showing where the website that you can go to, where you can download these digitally and send them to friends and family members as well. If we don't have any other questions, um, I'm gonna hand this over to Gary again. Um, I know that one of the things we wanted to end our time with you with is to have you guys put together some emergency disaster kits for some families in need that we will be distributing out into the community. So I'm gonna hand it over to Gary so he can tell you what you're doing and give you some instructions. All right, first thing we'd like to do guys is have everybody do a group photo. So if I could ask you, we're gonna move the podium and just have you come up in front of the step and repeat. If you guys, if you don't want your photo taken, it's absolutely fine. We'd love to have you in it, just so we can say you're part of this presentation today. We appreciate y'all coming out. Um, so let's do the photo and then I'll give you some quick instructions about the bag build. Very, very simple. And um, we'll get you on your way.
All right, guys, our last thing we're going to do is we're going to have you help us make these emergency bags. So we're going to set up a, a line here. Uh, everybody line up right here where Allie is. You're going to grab a bag. And as you go down the line, you're simply going to put the items into the bags based on the tag on the table. So we'll start off with two bottles of water. And then we're going to do two rolls of toilet paper all the way down until you're at the very end where the masks are. Once you're done, we'll put the bags on the table and then you guys are welcome to leave. Please grab some coffee, donuts, juice, fruit before you leave. And again, thank you for coming out today, okay? I just also wanted to let you guys know that we will be doing another, we do these every month, um, but the one in July will actually be virtual. It'll be on um, child nutrition and hunger um, and what we do over the summer to help feed children. So it'll be on July 12th, same time. Um, just it'll be from your computer. You wouldn't have to come here. Um, so we hope that you'll see the information, sign up again and be a part of our, our first virtual one. Good job. Yeah. Good job.